This week on the Eldritch Lawcast. Maybe part of D&D's longevity is its obtuseness. Asking about what pitfalls or experiences tend to turn new folks away from tabletop RPGs. You've already overwhelmed the player and they are now more likely to worry about doing the right thing than doing something. The D10 situation. Have to explain to them that a zero is a 10. You might also have to explain that a 10 is actually a one. We need to really distill down what is great about role-playing games. Is there any Australian culture things you've noticed that might have influenced your game design or, or creative voice? Trying to teach Australians something on, at 3 p.m. on a Friday, they're all going to be drunk, you know. American players are much more like, kill it, kill it with fire. Um, I would love to see a team of Aboriginal designers like bringing something to, together and showing it off because I think it's, it's incredible and cool. It would need to be done incredibly carefully particularly because these are stories from a living culture that it's it's the longest surviving culture on planet Earth, 60,000 plus years. All that and more right now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Eldridge Lawcast, episode 120. That's 100 episodes, more than the 20th. My name is Ben Byrne, and I am joined, as always, by Dale Kingsmill, James Haig, Sean Merwin. And, Sean, you haven't said anything in a while, so I'm going to ask you, what uh, is your use of critical failures and or fumbles in your tabletop RPGs? Do you use them? I do not when you're talking about 5th edition D&D. I tend to try to play the base game, whichever game I'm playing. So if the game I'm playing has critical failures and fumbles, I will definitely use it. If it doesn't, then I will not add it afterward because down that path lies madness and or fun sure. or fun madness, depending on how you look at things. Uh, but I've seen so many critical fail or critical fumble tables that are just not good. To the point where you're like decapitating yourself 20% of the time when you swing it, <laughs> uh, which <laughs> tends to put a damper on you know, role-playing games or stories that come out of role-playing games. Uh, sure. But I do like to have failure be more than just failure when it's story appropriate. So a natural one on a skill check or on something that's very dramatic, I will definitely add a complication to the scene, uh, but not on any sort of table that... Uh, is not uh, mutable in the moment. I don't use anything like that typically because I generally feel like a NAF one automatically failing the thing you're trying to do is punishment enough. Uh, but I do have players who love to get messed up. And that means that having something ha that happens sort of generally cosmetically whenever a foe hits them with a critical makes everyone at the table very happy because you know, I, I don't like things to like start death spiraling once they get critical. They don't like, you know, and now your arm is disabled and you can't hold your shield anymore. So your AC goes down like mm, maybe, maybe, but I would rather they like get a cool scar from where, you know, the Morgul blade right. pierced them uh, or something like that. Sa same whenever they get KO'd. Right, D&D, &D, fairly easy to get up from being KO'd, but just like imagine the cinematic aspect of going down, you've got this huge like burn scar that goes across your neck and you get healing word, you come back up, someone immediately gets you back down, right? You're getting wailed on over and over, constantly thrown back to the brink. Like if you don't come out of that fight with some really lingering, at, at least cosmetic uh, scars, then I think you're just kind of like ignoring the story of what happened in that fight. Sounds to me. Like, you're a real fan of grievous and permanent injuries, uh, which is a mechanic from Grim Hollow. Anyway, Dale Kingsmill, what about that. you? Do you do you <laughs> use fumbles? Uh, no, I similarly don't use fumbles. I uh, particularly hate fumbles. I'm going to use that word. I hate them. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't even necessarily treat a nat one as an automatic failure in my games. I think if you have a, a plus 16 to your roll, and you roll a one, then sh that should count as a 17, you know? Um, that's, that's kind of where I am with it. I, I Maybe on a case-by-case -case basis, I, I try to sort of feel out the places where um, rolling a natural one feels like a dramatic moment. You know what I mean? It, it like lifts it up. So the, the main place that I do have it mean something is on my injuries table. If you gotcha. roll a natural one on, on the injuries table, you get like, you lose an eye because then that's like the coolest injury, which again, people who aren't familiar doesn't have like an 
an, an extended eternal like mechanical impact it just means that you have this cool reminder of that time mm -hmm. that you got really badly hurt and you like this is this is the scar that you bear it's exactly that it's the is you you want to feel like you got messed up in that moment and so i i like to let that play out but it's only in those cinematic moments so the the only middle ground i can think of is that i might count natural ones as an automatic failure on a saving throw um because that feels a little more tense a little more elevated um but even then i don't i don't fumble i don't like fumbles i don't like them <laughs> look at us agreeing with each other because i heartily <laughs> agree i think that if you've got a fumble table um it's it, you know uh, in fact it, even like grievous injury tables i tend to uh, try to get past a single table because it can start to feel very uh repetitive when it's like and you've injured your other arm i suppose because you can't injure that that same arm twice or whatever and fumble table is like oh you dropped your sword again you you duffer um <laughs> and tends to turn the game into kind of like a benny, benny hill skit if people are rolling multiple ones um the only time i will use it is generally if it's more often than not uh, uh, an npc or a villain or a monster and they've rolled i've rolled like one twice in a row then it feels like okay, something something has gone wrong here for this individual. Uh, profoundly so. Space is speaking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Something this, this should is, have gone this, bad. This is where having just a, the slightest cognition of math will help you. Say, <laughs> do you want your your hero dropping their sword one in every twenty times they swing it? Because that's what math tells you is going to happen if you use one of these tables. Uh, so sure. just just think about it in those terms, and you can you can find yourself uh, in a better place uh, game design wise if you do that. Well, speaking of game design and uh, uh, award winning things such as some games that might have won some awards, uh, none have in the past week. But you know what did win an award, and finally, as far as I'm concerned is uh, the Dungeons & Dragons movie Honor Among Thieves got a golden tomato uh, for the best sci-fi and fantasy movie of 2023 uh, from the Rotten Tomatoes website for having the highest aggregate of reviews or something like that. I don't know. I thought it was well-deserved. Did you guys, has anybody seen that movie recently uh, and think it holds up six months later? I, I watched it probably like a couple months ago uh, with mm -hmm. the family members who hadn't seen it uh, previously and they loved it. So that's, you know, good. <laughs> yeah. I watched it with my parents just a couple of weeks ago, actually. And it was great. Yeah. Is, is there a better movie that takes reasonable D and D players and completely novice never played D and D doesn't know anything about it and gives them something that they can both enjoy hmm. because I don't, I don't see that. Uh, the only people I saw hating on it were the people that were like, you know, I want gruesome, grim death and seriousness sure. and all of that. And yeah, they can go watch their own movie. Yes, I agree. As someone who likes gruesome, grim death uh, uh, fantasy movies, the D&D &D movie was exactly what it needed to be. Go check it out if you haven't already because this has won an award. And you can check out our review discussion of it. If you click that up there, there's an hour-long discussion where we talk about how much we like the movie just after we saw the movie. It was a good movie. <laughs> Sorry, I won't do that voice again. <laughs> I apologize. I didn't like it. <laughs> Put it, Put it on the fumble table. Put it on the fumble table. Fair enough. Uh, very sadly, and I hope we're not setting a trend uh, for, for 2023, um, uh, but a titan of the RPG industry, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, uh, Janelle Jaquay uh, passed away uh, during the last week uh, after a battle with illness. Um, Janelle, I feel like, is someone who I know their name for a fairly specific reason, um, uh, but th their influence within the RPG industry is uh, incredibly, you know, felt, I think, as someone who maybe not a lot of modern players of the game know. Um, Sean, do you want to do you want to take this one? Do you are you sure. familiar enough with Janelle's work to? Well, believe it or not, I'm not old enough uh, to know uh, Janelle's work from when it first came out. But she was, you know, in D and D history. Someone who was on the fringes of TSR at first and made a great contribution by not working for TSR, but for bringing up and putting out content 
that was as good as what TSR was putting out for other companies, and then was later hired by TSR. So she was best known for adventures like Dark Tower and Caverns of Thracia, some of the first sort of dungeon crawl or exploration type adventures out there. Uh, She was also an artist, so she did the covers of certain magazines. I think her, not her art, but her content was in the first Dragon Magazine number one, the Dragon One. Mm. Uh, she also worked for Chaosium on on several products. Also worked on video games. Uh, she was a level designer for Quake. And the uh, Alexandrian had a great article about Jaquang the jun- the dungeon, which mm. you know, goes back to showing her take and her style for creating these dungeon crawl adventures. And how they could be made fun through the design, uh, the design sort of leading the story that was told mm. through the dungeon. So, you know, all of that is is true of Janelle. That's uh, that that's kind of where I felt her influence the most directly on myself was uh, probably that blog. Although I've seen uh, there's a YouTube video about uh, their game design philosophy as well in terms of dungeon design, the circular kind of dungeon design, ensuring there's always a second entrance uh, into a dungeon. And it's influenced me specifically in terms of, um, you know, when you create puzzles in dungeons or barriers in dungeons and you're kind of like, oh, I want the the players to go to this room to get a key that's going to unlock the door in this room Mm -hmm. to promote exploration, it can also accidentally lead to very linear dungeon design where they have to go get the key before they go do this. And so it it creates like one room after the other. So just being cognizant of every room as often as possible, as often makes sense within the dungeon, providing a second choice, you know, Mm -hmm. hidden, hidden, um, hidden, hidden rooms, uh, uh, circular design, I think, uh, and Janelle didn't work on this directly as far as, uh, uh, I know, but I think this is a great example is, uh, the, um, Cragmore Castle from uh, Lost Minds of Fandelva is just this very circular kind of dungeon design where you can spread out throughout that entire dungeon. Um, so, yeah. Um, also, an activist uh, for trans rights was uh, very active uh, in the trans rights community. Um, uh, so, for for everything that she did uh, for the industry and for society, I suppose. Uh, thank you, Janelle. All right, let's dive in with Sean's question first. Another Sean, but not this one, and not the one from, I think it was last week, but a different Sean again, I'm pretty sure. There's um, three of us. You could say you're pretty Sean. Mm-hmm. Uh, that okay. only works um, with the Australian accent. <laughs> although this question kind of is for sh- for our Sean because uh, they, they referenced uh, Caroline Pinebrook specifically uh, within this question, asking about what pitfalls or experiences tend to turn new folks away from tabletop RPGs. Um, And how does this affect your approach to game design or GMing for new players when you're introducing new people into it, into the game? I feel like I've answered this question vaguely. Maybe I want to hear what, what y'all have to say about your experiences with teaching new people or your own introduction into uh, role-playing games. This is a question I want to think about for a little bit because I haven't introduced anyone brand new. That, that's all right. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, and this kind of comes from teaching general uh, perspective uh, when you're teaching creative creative arts or, or a creative project to, to young people in particular. I remember last year at a convention I was at running a game for, there was a young uh, gentleman at a table. He would have been like 10 or 11 maybe. Um, and he had his dad on one side and he had a complete stranger on the other side. And by the end of the game, the two of them were basically just piloting his character for him. Mm. Um, I think uh, the thing is, uh, you know, playing games is about making choices uh, and feeling like your choices matter after you've made them for for good or ill. Um, and so I think m- helping players to realize, this is a bit of a ramble actually, this is not quite as uh, direct as I thought it was going to be, but um and saying that just made it more of a ramble. Um, but uh, 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 what I saw in that uh, uh, young player was that they shut off and they backed out of the game because they weren't given the time to make their own choices because I think their dad was a little bit anxious of like, oh, I don't want to slow the game down for the other players at the table. What you could do is this, this, or this. Um, but what you should really do is that. Um, but, th- but within that as well, helping folks to, uh, uh, know what their choices are and what the outcomes might be. 
um, within that because sometimes it can be overwhelming for players when they have infinite choices. And so sort of outlining what you could do is, you know, these two, maybe three things, these are the likely outcomes, but it's up to you what you want to do. If you think of something else, let me know. But these are, you know, lock them in so they're not overwhelmed by infinite choice, but also don't let people crowd into them telling them what what is the optimum choice or, or you know, that sort of thing. I hope that made some sense, um, makes, but just giving makes, new players time to feel the game. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And that's one of the things on my list is who are you trying to teach uh, at the table at the same time? Is it all new mm. players or is it a new player, two new players with experienced players? Because more often than not, the experienced players, even when their intention is noble, they are probably doing things that are not as helpful for the new players as you can provide as the game master. And that's one of those things. And I'm not talking about toxic players. I'm not talking, you know, I'm talking about people who are generally excited about the game and love the game and want new people in the game. But that excitement, you as an experienced player might be excited about the game for a different reason than a new player would be. So while you're yeah. explaining what you're excited about and what draws you to the game, you may not realize that what's exciting for you is detrimental to the other person, right? All the options. Well, you could use this spell or this spell or that spell or do that. You've already overwhelmed the player and they are now more likely to worry about doing the right thing than mm-hmm. doing something. So that's that's a very good one, Ben. The the other, you know, how many times have we been, particularly at a board game table, and one player who's the new player at the table goes, oh, how do I do this? And they get three explanations mm-hmm. from everybody around the table. And I feel really combative whenever I have to say to people, hey, just let me explain because otherwise it's going to get confused. <laughs> I don't like saying that, but I think as the the GM, when you've got new players at the table, maybe it behooves you at the start of the session to just be like, hey, if anybody has m- any mechanical questions, let me explain it because I know you're trying to help, but it, it can get confusing if you're getting two or three explanations of something. Pitfall has to do with information as well, but specifically it's not from a table dynamics perspective. It's from a game design perspective and it's about information latency. It's about how long it takes for a choice you've made for its consequences to show up or for you to understand what you've done. For me, I like high information latency because I'm familiar with the way this kind of game goes, right? I'm, I, I, it feels to me like an ideal part of exploration. It's cryptic and I like cryptic. I like the way that things in like dark souls for a video game example, never quite you you don't really quite understand what pulling that lever did but you know it did something and if you were paying attention back in the hub world when you go back you'll find oh it opened that door Mm -hmm. right it makes the world feel alien and like not made for you it feels like you're exploring it you're not on a on an amusement park you know fantasy land area but if a lot of your cognition is already being used to understand the game system uh, to download all that information and start using it for the first time, right? You're forming a lot of like neuron connections for the very first time. Throwing in that extra layer of abstraction or crypticness can be extremely frustrating. And so I think it's totally okay <laughs> for new players to get a more simplified, uh, not just a more simplified version of the system, but a more simplified version of like the the software, I guess, uh, just because every every concession you can make to making those brain connections form more smoothly and have that onboarding process go more easily uh, is, uh, generally speaking, a greater likelihood that you're going to keep that player playing for longer. And I, I would say that generally speaking, if you're a player who is, you know, you're playing for the first time, this this advice is like this advice could be detrimental to you if you like already have some experience with this level of crypticness you want the mystery you want all of that but all of that comes from uh in my opinion experiences with things outside of gaming right is a lot of experience with mystery stories could make you really like interested in the cryptic aspect uh and sort of that's a part of your brain that has already like developed those connections. So you have all the room you need to develop the new connections for just the way the game works. And it's it synergized. It's just, it's just the opposite of the way it might work otherwise. 
there's neuroscience involved in gaming, right? So gaming and psychology are deeply intertwined. So if I've remembered during all of this some very specific instances where I can remember the light dying in a new player's eyes. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Those moments include the moment that they discover they've been rolling the D12 instead of the D20, oh, or vice gotcha. versa, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. uh, to them, there's no difference. They don't like the, the the connection is not made that that those are different shapes and that they have different numbers on them, uh, or, or you know the the importance of that difference doesn't land. Uh, the D10 situation where a new player has to roll a D10 for some reason, and you have to you have to explain to them that a zero is a ten, oh, and depending no, on <laughs> which one of the D10s the the percentile dice they've picked up, you might also have to explain that a ten is actually a one. Oh, that's that my favorite bit. Good. That's my favorite bit. When they roll a D10 for the first time, they get a zero and they go, oh, nothing. Okay. Oh, shattered. <laughs> uh, the worst thing is when it happens in the other direction, they've picked up the, the double digit one. They roll it. They yeah. go, I got a 10. And you go, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. That's fair. You that's to take fair. it away. Yeah. Uh, spell casting, just in general. I told the story of my sister finding out how spell casting works. Uh, death mechanics. This is pretty broad, but the specific instance I'm thinking of is Pathfinder, where a player hit zero hit points and they were like, oh, I'm dead. And I was like, well, no, actually, um, <laughs> you don't die until you hit negative your hit points. And that was even worse because it was like, why? Because they were so used to zero being dead. Uh, right. So they didn't love the existence of death mechanics. And especially if they were slightly different to general hit point mechanics. Um, the disappointment upon discovering that Dragonborn don't fly. Hmm. That one made someone really sad. Uh, and then, of course, maths in general, the the whole what to add problem, because it, it doesn't connect. For a long time, it doesn't connect what numbers you're adding and why you're adding them. And so it's so easy to be rolling and adding the wrong number or to be rolling and not adding any number or, you know, just sitting there looking at your page paralyzed because there's all these numbers in your character sheet and you don't know what you're meant to be adding. Um, so those are all the things that I can remember specifically putting off new players. That is such a great list. And that was literally weeks of conversation summed up when I was developing uh, Peril and Pine Book, right? All of those things that Dale just mentioned are problems that need to be overcome, either through the presentation or through omission or through the adventure. And so if you go through Peril and Pinebrook and look at the differences between that and, you know, fifth edition D&D, Dale just summed up most of them right there. Get rid of the numbers. Mm. Get rid of too many choices. Get rid of the death saving throws. Get, you know, get rid of those things that do cause confusion and therefore angst or negative feelings in new players. And really... You know, why do everyone loves D and D and role playing games for different reasons? Everyone loves stories, movies, wh what have you, entertainment for different reasons. But a lot of it has to do with going from the known to the unknown, and then the no unknown becomes known, and then you move further into the unknown. And so, when you're doing a, a game like D and D and trying to teach it. The first thing you need to do is make what's known known as quickly as possible. Let the player learn quickly what it is that they know and what it is that they do. Then the joy of exploring the unknown isn't learning the game. It's in, 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 in taking the story, learning of, of the story. And then the dice. The dice are what a lot of people love about the game, right? These beautiful weird shaped dice and you want to roll them and then you want the story to change and you want the unknown to become known based on those dice. And if you can do that a few times before you have to spend an hour going through some obscure arcane rules, then you are doing you know, the Lord's work in terms of teaching role playing games. I have something I want to say, but I don't know if I have like the right words to vocalize it. Well, it's, it's about, it's about like player retention, I guess, right? Like there, there's a lot to be said that maybe part of D&D's longevity is its obtuseness. And it's the fact that people can spend a lot of time engaging with the game without playing the game by debating the game and discussing the game and working out the edge case and getting mad online about the game. Whereas 
And, and whenever like an indie publisher or, or even a well-established publisher, right? Like wants to make a new tabletop game. There's this discussion that's had over accessibility versus like long-term play. And it, because D and D is so dominant, it feels like uh, long-term play re- really can never be much of a consideration because we kind of have to expect new games to be secondary to D and D if we're marketing to a you know a, a typical TTRPG audience. And and the audience changes, right? Mm. When I was learning how to play the game, D and D was the greatest thing I could imagine. Because the video games I was playing were pixels, <laughs> uh, right? The, the, the TV I was watching, there was one channel and it was pretty blurry. So this was the greatest thing. There is now uh, so much out there that, that is enticing and entertaining and astounding that we need to really distill down what is great about role-playing games and present that to players as an alternative to the other things that they could be doing. So uh, I think James is absolutely right in that there is some power in the the arcane nature of complicated games. Some of us love really complicated board games because of that. But we have mm-hmm. to get people there first. And, and that's why we need to focus on those really cool things that we love and then move move them forward through the ranks until they're like, okay, now I understand D&D. I want to play these 27 other games, or I want this new critical fumble system that I read, and I want to use that uh, because I really want to delve down deep into this. I also think it's worth mentioning. So this is something that just occurred to me. So um, I, I think it's true probably more of adults than it is of kids who are learning the game. Um, because I think adults are trained to fear um, being wrong or looking stupid or silly. Right, right? yeah, right. And I, I, this this came up in my head because um, I was asking for video ideas on my YouTube channel the other day and someone suggested, I, I think, a really good idea, which was, you know, I always end my videos, email this to your grandma, and they suggested, why don't you play D&D with your grandma? And I thought that would be great. I would love to run D&D for my grandma and I'm already stripping I got Peril and Pinebrook and I'm stripping it back even further. I'm like, how can I make this absolutely the simplest version I, I possibly can? And I floated the idea with her the other day and she seemed really nervous. She seemed really scared. She didn't want to do it. And I'm not going to make her do it um, because if it's something that's going to really freak you out, um, you're not going to be able to enjoy it. And I think that that would be really sad. But I think that is something that a lot of adults particularly are really wary of they don't they don't want to get it wrong but it's hard to learn something and especially something that's complicated or or different like you really have to work a lot of different brain muscles to what you have before um Mm. it's hard to learn that without doing things wrong um Mm. so so if that's not a hurdle that you're um willing to to risk tripping over then it's going to be really really hard that was something that I learned uh, running a game. It was only for three people um, at a public event um, in, a, in a bar. And um, there was one lady at the table in particular who I realized had that exact issue. They didn't want to get it wrong. Um, and, and I think, you know, the advice that I wrap into this is just l- listen to the players. I think somebody said this earlier, may- maybe in the chat, but, but listening to what their needs are as they learn the game as well, because this particular woman was playing a rogue, um, and started asking me questions that I was a little bit puzzled by at the time, which were things like, uh, okay, it's your turn. Um, uh, what would you like to do to, to fight this monster? And it was a very kind of, you know, early level mundane monster. It was like a wolf or something like that. And she was asking me questions like, well, what would I do? What would a rogue do? And I'm like, oh, you can do anything. Like, you don't have to worry about like what I think you would do. Um, you know, you could throw a dagger at it or whatever. And then they started asking me, well, what, what's the optimum choice for a rogue to make though? And it wasn't until kind of after the game that I realized Okay, they they were asking for a bit more help than I realized they were asking for and they might have wanted a little bit of piloting of their of their of their character just so that they didn't feel like they were going to mess the whole thing up um necessarily. Um that's so, the perfect Sean, I've said something to my that's, last thing, 
which is don't tell the players you can do anything, even though it's true. (laughs) Because yes, you can do anything, but the game expects you to do certain things. There are rules Mm. in place that you are good at these things. So rather than saying you can do anything you want, you say, in this game, your character can do anything you want, but in certain situations, there are things that you are great at doing. Rogue, you are great at stabbing things with your sword when somebody else, or shooting things with your bow when there's someone else next to the creature you're shooting. So that's the position you want to put yourself in. And if you can do that for each of the players, it does give them the freedom to do whatever they want, but it also lets them know what the game expects them to do in very specific Mm. situations. I've discovered, I think, that particularly adults, telling them there are no wrong answers is not particularly useful in assuaging that fear of giving a wrong answer. It's almost something that you have to discover for yourself and then you'll kind of relax into the game. And until you've reached that point, a little bit of hand-holding and a little bit of like giving them specific options is the, is the way to go. That's more of a question than a statement. I had a really weird weekend last weekend. Um, I went down to visit my, my brother and his wife and uh, two of my friends came with me and that forms my main D&D group that I run. Um, and uh over the past couple of weeks i've just been having like a miserable couple of weeks for my creative self-esteem like i feel like i can do no right when it comes to the things i'm writing like just you know the nature of a creative right and Mm. and that that bled into (laughs) my dming and i was like oh my god i'm just stepping on every rake imaginable like i cannot make this run smooth um and meanwhile, my my brother and his wife have a a like freshly one year old toddler who's just running around the house and making nonsense noises and playing with every you know every block wrong and like like eating cars, uh, <laughs> just just everything. And it, it's really only once I got back home uh, last night, I started being like, "Oh my god, w- why why was I not?" in baby mode the entire time why was i not approaching this the most sort of novice minded beginner's mind approach because you know my my friends love me i i and they loved the game i was running stepping on every rake making bad decisions because it was still a fun game right uh, mm-hmm. they were still doing stuff with their characters and and it all worked out and i think that's just like If someone else who is a little bit sharper than me right now can find a way to distill the point of, you know, how do you communicate, just approach things with, you know, the curiosity of a baby and you'll be great, uh, then then I welcome it because it's it's exactly the dichotomy y'all were talking about between the kid who is getting piloted by by the two adults on either side of him versus the adult who wanted piloting. And so it's a kid's love to be wrong before they're taught that being wrong is bad because they, they learn from it. And, and every bit of feedback is just like, it can be treasured. Speaking of other things, um, I'm going to jump uh, a little bit here in our run sheet. I apologize uh, only because this email has been sitting in our inbox for probably over six months now. And it's a funny email. And uh, I got to adopt this voice uh, to be able to, to read this oh, email. Crikey. Out. crikey. This email coming in from Ollie. Uh, Ollie, Ollie, uh, fe- Ollie. <laughs> yeah, fellow, fellow Aussie, fellow Larrikin. G'day, uh, g'day, g'day. Emailing in and asking, Ben and Dale, how has being an Australian, or being an Australian, because we both Australian. still are, Australian, yeah, uh, influenced your game design? Is there a strictly Australian role playing culture? Uh, and, and, and for, for Sean and James on this side of the, the, the other side of the question, uh, uh, how have Aussies influenced you as, uh, uh, is there any Australian culture things you've noticed that might've influenced your game design or, or creative voice? You can say, no, we won't be offended. It's interesting. It's hard to say in terms of the, the game design element, all of the design folks that I know, I know from the U S broadly speaking, I know that we have designers in Australia, obviously, but I just don't know as many of them. Uh, So I can only speak from the sort of entertainment sector. And I will say that the culture here is a bit different. 
it's definitely shaped by the fact that we are really far flung, whereas a lot of the entertainment element of a tabletop RPG as an industry are based in LA. Uh, they're all kind of, you know, that's where the actors go. That's where the entertainers go. A lot of, a, a lot of the entertainment um, folks are, are based in the one city. Here we are across all of the different You know, we've got a couple in, in Perth. We've got a couple in Adelaide. we got a, a little hub down in Melbourne, but hub still feels like the wrong word because it's not that many. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Queensland and Darwin don't seem to be repping. Um, we got the Kiwis. Uh, come on, Queensland. Some of come on, Darwin. Whom, uh, from the UK. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a bizarre little mishmash of things and we kind of see each other uh, only a few times a year. Um, I will say... A lot more of us than I expected still do come from acting backgrounds, theater backgrounds. And it's, it's like in unexpected ways. The fact, like when I found out that Ben had an acting background and then at some point we were at like a, a, a pre uh, Paxar's event and the lights flickered and I made a joke about they were they were signaling that we had to get back into the theater to our seats and everybody laughed. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that was meant to be niche, but apparently we all sure. have the same background. So, um, yeah, I can I can really only speak to the uh, entertainment factor, but those are my observations. On the streaming side of things, uh, the distance is a practicality that we've got to deal with on a daily basis and do a lot of kind of in-window uh, kind of streaming, which is popularised in the US as well. But you're right, there's a lot more kind of studio streaming. I think we've got, I think, oh, we've got a handful of, of in-studio kind of streams that happen. Um, but speaking uh, for a moment more from like a the the, 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 the culture of play, and the culture of being at it conventions, is. I guess the things that I've really noticed are, um, uh, and this was a culture shock for me, we don't pay for games at conventions. I was shocked to learn that games had ticket prices on top of the convention cost uh, when you go to a convention. Uh, in Australia, you just, you, you're just you in, you just go to a table and sign up and you get a table to, to go play at. Um, that being said, it feels similar to the US, but it feels like we're a couple of years behind you know, we only had Adventurers League maybe the last three, four years. Some, some folks kind of kicked it into into high gear, and I think it might not be around as much anymore. I'm not really sure. Um, but but there's a growing excitement for D&D here uh, from a public perspective, um, much like we've seen, uh, you know, broadly speaking. But a lot of people coming in going, oh, yeah, I'll give this a go. Why not? Check it out. <laughs> uh, but from a game design perspective, I'm not really sure. This might be a little bit of a, of a spicy one. This might be a little bit of a hot lizard. I'm not really sure. But um, I find I am sometimes surprised by the subtle differences in Australian and American morality as depicted in uh, role-playing games. And this could just be a me thing, but I find, I think, I think that I find that, like, corporal punishment is much more accepted by, by American players than it is Australian players, you know? They're much more like, ah, we'll give him a go. What's wrong with this guy? You know, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll see what's up with him. Whereas American players are much more like, kill it, kill it with fire. He deserves it. He did wrong. It's subtle, though. It's not like everyone's like that. I don't know. Maybe it's a me thing. <laughs> it's subtle, he says, after the most extreme version Statement. of those statements. But <laughs> I get what you're saying. Yeah. Is, is, is a hot lizard something that people say in Australia? Or did you make that nah, up? No, I just made it up. Okay. No, nah, I just made it up. We, yeah. But uh, we do have things that are a little bit similar. Like, what's that one about? Uh, there is laid out like a flag of wana, right? Anyway, I, I, um, I have no idea what the sort of broad cultural attitude towards just straight up murking a guy is between America and Australia. Because the players who I play with regularly, uh, Love to love to chat with every evil SOB they find. <laughs> um, and generally speaking, in my experience playing with Aussies, they're extremely aggro. So my yeah, experience okay. is the total right. opposite of yours. Yeah, I think it's a me thing. I think it's a me thing. We'll, we'll drop that. We'll come back. That's a separate discussion uh, uh, in terms of uh, casual violence in games. In a previous life, I did uh, software uh, support. So I would go and I would teach people how to use my company's software. And we had a, a big Australian contingent. So for a while, I was supporting Australia. So it was Thursday morning at about 1 a.m. for me, which is Friday afternoon in Australia. And I had to 
give this big presentation. This was pre-Zoom, so this was all via phone. And they were following along, but on the phone, I could tell that there were probably 20 people in this conference room learning how to use the software. And someone joked with me like, oh, you're trying to teach Australians something on, at 3 p.m. on a Friday. They're all going to be drunk, you know? And I'm like, ha, 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 that's funny. Yeah, right? I think they were. I really, <laughs> really think they were because... It was chaos on the other end of this phone. Uh, it was chaos. And these were professionals. Uh, and so I had to, two months later, I had to do it again uh, because they just didn't even hear anything the first time. And so when I started at Ghostfire, I was like, is that going to be what I'm dealing with now? And it was. <laughs> and it, it, was like, yes. it totally was. No, it, it totally wasn't. Uh <laughs> A very but all I mean, all of the interactions I've had with my Australian colleagues there have has been wonderful, and I've seen a few. Yeah, you know, we joke about what does this phrase mean? What does that phrase mean? Sure, like we did sure. on the show, but I haven't seen either in terms of you know business interaction or game interaction a huge difference between America, Australia, and other parts of the the Western world. Uh, the, the business part. example that is most famous, I don't know whether other people know this story, there was a story about um, Americans and I don't remember whether they were Brits or Australians um, trying to, to organise a meeting and tabling something <laughs> means the exact opposite. In, right. In, you know, whether it means yeah. to put something on the table to be discussed or to take it off the table to talk about later. Put it on the side table. We had that particular problem with with an email between us and uh, somebody at, at the company. And they're like, let's table this. And I'm like, wait a second, shouldn't we be discussing it? And they're like, yes, that's what I mean. I'm like, no, tabling it means to, to set it aside. They're like, no, tabling it means to discuss it. It's like, okay, well, there okay. we go. We've, we've had you're our culture the boss. Interestingly here, particularly from a, uh, a, to kind of crack into this topic a little bit, from a white Australian perspective, our fantasy is very globalized and Europeanized, right? Um, uh, and there are some fantastic uh, stories uh, that belong to our indigenous cultures that I feel, you know, I personally am not equipped to tell or, or have any right to tell. But I think that uh, it would, th there would be, that's where you would see some real differences. Uh, from uh, some Australian creators, if some Indigenous creators who were into the uh, RPG scene wanted to create a, a setting based on uh, Indigenous mythologies and, and the dreaming and, and uh, those sort of things, because those stories are, are fascinating and, uh, and very interesting. And I think that's why at, at first blush, there's not a lot of difference between, you know, what is created in Australia for the RPG industry and what is created in um, in in America, at least in, in fantasy, because again, it's all very Europeanized and very informed by Tolkien and mythologies and things that date back to Europe. The one exception I've realized as I'm thinking of this is I believe Chaosium, um, who have a strong Australian contingent as well, uh, actually do have, oh man, I'm going to forget the name of it. It's like Horror Australialis or something where they have a, a Call of Cthulhu. Maybe the chat can help me out with this. Um, supplement that is a little bit more based on uh, Australian culture and Australian um, mythos, uh, if that makes sense. Well, it's interesting you bring that up, Ben, because when I spent six weeks in Australia uh, now two years ago, uh, I I got to thinking about what if Ghostfire published a like a extremely directly. Aussie setting or adventure or, or something, something that, that distinctly has that Aussie flavor because, you know, Ghostfire's primary audience is American. And so we do our best to like stick to what sells to that American dominated international market. And I never raised this suggestion to anyone just because the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, damn. One, y'all are right. The, the Aussie like TGRPG creation and playing community is pretty small. Uh, and if something like this were to be done, it, we would need to find, uh, probably an indigenous led team or, or, or at least, you know, a, a team that had that perspective in a major way. 
And if even the the European Australian RPG community is fairly small, even having been at Paxos twice now and looking around and meeting a bunch of creators, I don't think I've met a single uh, a, a single Aussie Aboriginal person who has any interest in TTRPGs. Which, like, well, you Daily might, might have had. met um, Dead Aussie Gamer, who oh, is, oh, is, is, is Dag online, um, yeah, for sure. Um, I, there is, I, this is, I mean, in amongst all these conversations, so by the way, Dante says that it was called Terra Australis, as in Terror Australis, which is a funny play on Terra Australis, which is the southern land, the great southern mm-hmm. land. Um, but, uh, no, it, there's also, you know, I've had, um, discussions, debates with my mother, whose doctoral thesis was on, uh, fantasy fiction about whether or not a key genre element of fantasy, uh, as we currently understand it is a sense of northernness, right? Which is something that, um, Lewis talks about where he, he talks about, um, reading about uh, Siegfried and the Twilight of the Gods for the first time and being swept up into the great northern skies and blah, blah, blah. So this sense of magic being tied to a concept of northernness, which also gets tied into the idea of, in Europe, the concept being that northern is is rugged, it's difficult, it's cold, it's, you know, harsh, whereas in the south it's it's languid, it's it's Greek and, and Roman mythology, right? So it's a very different vibe. Um, I personally do not think that that is a an absolute requirement of fantasy. Uh, I'm steadfast on that, but I have way less evidence. Uh, but I mm. definitely, I remember a, a bizarrely formative um, fantasy text for me growing up was an Australian fantasy book that I don't remember the name of. And I wanted a copy, like I read it I read it in school in fifth grade. It was like a book that we read in class and I loved it so much and I wanted a copy, but it was out of print. It had been out of print for for decades and decades, like it was uh. this really old one, but it was, um, you know, it, it had these influences of, um, uh, you know, it, lots of lots of different kind of cultural elements of, of Australia kind of coming together in this fantasy text. So I believe that there's a way to do it. Uh, I don't know what it is. <laughs> mm. um, and it is it is definitely tricky because it is one of those things where, you know, I, I grew up in um, in Nara, which has a, a high Indigenous population, and um, and I grew up learning a, a lot of dreaming stories through Ms. Sims, who was um, an auntie, an Aboriginal auntie. And I was, you know, fortunate enough to have these stories, but they're stories that I, you know, even having a channel where I talk about mythology, I had to kind of make that decision at some point that I wasn't going to tell those stories on my channel because they're not my stories. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, the funny thing is the stories I was allowed in on, uh, the, the stories that basically that the white kids get, tell, get told, uh, the stories for the, the little kids. Once you start getting older, it kind of divides up into different, you know, categories. The boys get told different stories to the girls and at different ages you learn different things. And there's all these sort of different, you know, um, we have we have a phrase in Australia, um, s- secret women's business, right? It's, it's, it's the idea that you only learn certain things as pertains to you. And the things that, that the white folks get told, those are the ones, the very base level, like little kid stories. Um, but even those, they're not my story to tell. So I do mm. think that it would, if, if we were to, and I, I do think it would be incredible to see, um, I would love to see uh, a, a team of, you know, a- Aboriginal designers, like bringing something to, together and showing it off because I think it's, it's incredible and cool. Uh, it would need to be done incredibly carefully, particularly because these are stories from a living culture, a living culture yeah. that it's, it's the longest surviving culture on planet Earth, 60,000 plus years. Um, and so treating it as mythology even becomes a very delicate subject um, because sure. for, for many, many people it is not. If uh, uh, an- another part of uh, Ollie's question just about, uh, you know, Australian creators in the space, um, you know, Ghostfire Gaming, he-, he asked, why do we have an Australian contingent? We are originally an Australian company. We were founded uh, in Australia, still not dropping it. Um, uh, uh, Fragged Empire is also an RPG uh, from an Australian creative team. If you want to go check that out, it's not fifth edition. It's an entirely different uh, RPG. I think it's post-apocalypse is Fragged Empire, but there are also um, some sort of fantasy and sci-fi uh, spin-offs up from it. I think it just got a second edition relatively recently. Uh, and then Chaosium has a, a, a large Australian team. Oh, and Story Brewers, who we had on the podcast uh, over Christmas, have a very story-based um, uh, 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 kind of RPGs, um, such as the Jane Austen role playing game, 
which name good is society? absolutely escaping. Good society. Thank you so much. You saved me there. Uh, good society. Um, good mate. Um, uh, and then finally, uh, and this might be the last part of this question uh, to come up, uh, which was Ollie's uh, part of Ollie's question. Sean and James. Now, Dale and I did this a little while ago on a video on her channel, but now it's your turn. What would you put, if you were designing an Australian D&D setting, what do you think would be the quintessential components of it? For all the reasons just mentioned, I would not be creating one. That's fair. Let, let, let me do the development work and the rules design and y'all make the setting. How's that? I, I would love to like... Again, the common vocabulary here is failing me because I like I, I want to say I would love to lead a project, but that doesn't mean I think what it sounds like is I would love to assemble a team for a project and be the unifying force for a project. This because it's it's the sort of thing where I think there are a lot of cool stories to be told, and often I think having a kind of outsider perspective is a good way of untangling. Uh, what is taken for granted versus what is uh, also kind of fantastical, but it needs to be tempered by someone with that lived in experience as well. And that's why it's so vital that in, uh, in games development or any kind of media development, having like cultural consultancy from the beginning is so vital, right? It's something that's there from the start. It's not something you bring in at the end when nothing can really be changed anymore that is vital for the building blocks of it. And so, yeah, I mean, like it's, it's not the exact same answer as, as what you gave Sean, but there, there are things to me from an outsider's perspective that I think are really fertile ground for storytelling. Like just like the, the inception of the colonial nation of Australia, right. As a, as a former penal colony that became its own entity. I think that's a really compelling story hook. Uh, but just like, just like with sort of the, the foundation of America, it's hard to make an American role-playing game because you, you, you must like grapple with, uh, the concept of genocide in order to do it and, and, uh, other terrible, terrible things. And it's just, it's, it's not something that I feel like I have the savoir faire necessary to do and certainly not all on my own. It's true. And it's also, I mean, it's worth dropping in there as well that we're, we're also, you know, talking very broadly about yeah. a culture that is actually lots and lots and lots of different cultures and language groups, for example. But um, it was brought up by Horrible Cabbage in chat as well that there is kind of this element even outside of that when you're talking about like Australian culture. It, you know, we have such a, a huge migrant population from lots mm. of different places. You know, we've got Lebanese, Greek, uh, we've got, we got tons of uh, Asian immigrants who come over from Vietnam, from China, you know, we got this, this massive melting pot of cultures that all come together. Um, and the, the kind of weird amalgam of, of that into an, a, a quote unquote Australian identity, like what, who, who is the, the Australian. Um, and again, my mom has taught a class that looks at, um, specifically advertising in Australia and how it's changed over time and how it shows you the the changing perception of what the Australian identity is. Because if you look sort of in the mid 80s or whatever, it really is the Ocker. Why does Ocker is, mm. um, sorry, uh, Ocker is like deeply, <laughs> deeply Australian. What I, the um, accent I was doing is Ocker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's kind of um, middle class, um, work, blue collar worker, strong accent, um, drinks a beer, uh, you know, it's that that guy and it was, Ocker it was is the nice way of saying bogan yeah which <laughs> which you get you get it <laughs> yeah I, yeah. Uh, it, yeah no um so it was a white australian sort of blue collar man right and then over time that shifts because we've got all this influx of of different people from different places we've got you know recognition of this this huge kind of multicultural uh melting pot of weirdness and it's you know is is the delightfulness of you know half my friends at school being on the phone to their mum and being like like having an, an argument about homework that is half in Macedonian you know what I mean like it's it's this delightful kind of um factor that does tend to get overlooked a little bit when um looking from outside from from overseas I I suspect uh, well one, one quick recommendation I do have for people who are uh, curious uh, about um 
specifically Indigenous voices within Australia. I watched this on the plane back over. I'd never seen it before, but I'd heard a lot about it. It's a TV series. I don't know if you've seen this, Dale, called The Clever Man. Oh, oh The uh, Clever Man, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I, I haven't seen the full thing yet. I've, I've got like a couple of episodes to go. Actually, I might even have a season to go. But The Clever Man is uh, largely created by Indigenous creators, to my understanding, um, and it kind of ties in a bit of uh, Indigenous stories into it. Um, uh, it's billed as a uh, an Indigenous Australian superhero story, but that's not really what it is. But it's kind of got a little bit of that that vibe to it. Um, uh, and also accepting, and, and the show says this that it's it is that melting pot of, as Dale said, I- the Indigenous cultures of Australia, uh, 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 many and varied, and and uh, uh, you know many different languages, many different cultures. The Clever Man kind of draws from a couple of different places. Uh, to create uh, quite a uh, an interesting tale. I just want to say, this is just a thought that's coming to me, uh, that there's a lot of focus right now, I think, in, in new RPGs or new settings on having those melting pot societies. You can see it in, um, in Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, for example, right? The, the uh, Dwendalian Empire and its major cities all have a huge focus on that. When, when Waterdeep, the new Waterdeep came, book came out. There was a lot of focus put on what is what is unique and different, but also sort of melded together by all the different wards of the city. Um, and it it strikes me that when when I think of classic high fantasy, I really do think of like European history, where all the countries had their national borders. And they were always going to war with one another. And there was all this sort of frontier land and, and wilderness and hidden forests that had things you know, here, there'd be dragons at the edges of the map, that sort of thing. Whereas the fantasy that's being made right now tends to understand that, you know, those concepts as like, I don't know, as precious as they are to me from a fantasy reader's heart, as, as the child who read that fantasy that child has now grown up into the adult that knows that you know, all, all of that is is predicated on a sort of like in group out group mentality, and we're really trying to avoid that right now here in the twenty first century. Um, and it, it makes me wonder because it makes me wonder, especially because those two examples of modern melting pot fantasy I gave to you are American examples: Critical Role and and Wizards of the Coast. It makes me wonder if there's room for uh, oh and and gosh the the example that was evading me fantasy high right dimension twenties fantasy high which takes that sort of modern nineteen fifties nineteen eighties Americana pastiche and turns that like subtext into just text if there's if there's a way to create a new setting that is not grounded in pastiche like fantasy high is, but still bring forth that ethos to make a quintessentially American or a quintessentially Aussie setting that draws more from the modern uh, uh, like existence of that, of all of those tropes, rather than trying to strip it back to the folk history of all of those tropes. I think it would be done. I, I, I think if it were to be done, that might be, that might be the way to do it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Dale. Uh, another. All I have is if people are looking for the stereotypical by by Jingo um, Australian fair income stuff. Yeah, we did a Ben and I did a video on my channel. <laughs> we, <laughs> we made. Like, you can find that video right over here. It'll be there if you're watching it this on YouTube, and if you're not, then uh, go. You look to- like you're doing a TikTok. <laughs> That was the most millennial thing I think you've ever said, and I mean that in, like, boomer <laughs> style thing. Like, you look like you're doing a TikTok. Yes. Huh? Yeah? Am I doing it? Am I yeah. doing it? <laughs> Am I doing the TikTok? Um, anyway, uh, we'll turn that into a dance. That's what you TikTok. look like. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, all right, all right, all right. So, so you said, so you said. Um, that being said, uh, this episode is probably bang on an hour, I think, from when we st- stopped rambling about uh, uh, video game soundtracks and started talking about RPGs. Um, so I think we will call it there for this week. Thank you so much, everybody, uh, for joining us. Um, if you want to send an email like Ollie did uh, or uh, like Sean did, uh, you can send them to podcast at ghostfiregaming.com. You can uh, come and chat with us directly. Thank you so much for being here once again, uh, Twitch chat. 
Uh, we are here 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 3 p.m. Pacific on a Monday, and it's 10 a.m. Uh, Tuesday Australian Eastern Standard Time uh, because of the time zone, timey-wimey zones and, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, and uh, otherwise, you can find us on YouTube, Spotify, all the places, the likes, the subscribes. They help get us out to more listeners. They're not essential. They're not essential to your enjoyment uh, of the Lawcast, um, but they are a nice to have. Um, my name's Ian Van Burn here with Dale Kingsmill, Sean Merwin, and James Ake, and we will see you coppers again next week. Have a good one. That's how you drum in an Australian accent. Yeah. Ba 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 ba